you never think war will come to you. To your hometown. To your neighborhood. Then it does. And all you can do is witness the tragedy and pray for it to end. But the reality is that it's always happening in someone's home, to someone's family and friends. This time, it was mine. This is a year of war in Sudan. On a quiet Saturday morning, Sudan's capital city was turned into a battleground. The army and the paramilitary rapid support forces were suddenly at war. And residents were trapped by heavy fighting for days before the first evacuations began. And a nation became scattered. In the early moments, everything felt like a daze. Like seeing an old friend in a hotel room in Djibouti as she recounts her evacuation. The experience, the kind you never imagined you would find yourself in. It was a very, very difficult journey. Surprisingly, the kids were well behaved. There wasn't much crying. I think everyone was just shocked. She landed in the East African port city with hundreds of other foreign passport holders forced to leave her loved ones behind to get her children to safety. Both our parents are besieged in Sudan's capital, Khartoum. We're panic-stricken and bereft. The guilt you say is, um, is unbearable. And you just think to yourself, should I have left? Should I have stayed behind? It just angers me so much that beautiful Sudan, with its beautiful people, is being governed by boys with very dangerous toys. There aren't any commercial flights to take us into Sudan, so we leave Africa to move closer. We fly from Djibouti to Saudi Arabia in the hopes of crossing the Red Sea to Port Sudan and then moving deeper in towards the capital, Khartoum. We're rushing in as people rush out. And stand on the edge of Saudi Arabia's Jeddah port as ships bring in the lucky ones. Foreign nationals and Saudi residents. It's just unbelievable. The ships slowly pulling in. You start to see people's features. You see the eagerness on their faces to get to safety after 10 hours at sea. Finally, just some solace from what has been the most horrifying time. How are you feeling? I'm glad for good friends in Saudi Arabia today. Yeah, you're American, I'm I am an American, yeah. And, and what was it like for you getting out? Uh, it was a long journey out of Khartoum. Um, Lots of craziness happening, but you know what? The, the Sudanese people themselves were beautiful people. If it hadn't been for the Sudanese people helping us at each journey, each step of the way, uh, it was absolutely beautiful. And then to see our friends and brothers in Saudi Arabia get us here, I'm truly grateful. The only way to know what's happening inside is from those who managed to escape. Hundreds and hundreds of people in Port Sudan waiting. waiting. Yeah. And in Khartoum. In Khartoum as well. Trapping Khartoum, yeah. Khartoum at Nin. They have been trapping in Khartoum and this still group of people trapped there. Can you believe this one? Running out of water, children yeah. inside. So, but okay. then we, we got the chance to be here. It's a, it's a heaven. <laughs> my questions are pointed because my parents are still trapped in Khartoum, the hell they've just fled. As we frantically tour the evacuation vessel, I half expect to see another old friend, but not this. Oh my god, that's my uncle. That's my uncle. I don't want to see him. I'm panic. I'm gonna miss it now. I feel so much love and relief to see him. 
But I also see my mother in his face. I need to get on a boat and get in. I can't believe it's happening. The last two weeks have felt like the longest of my life and it's moving closer, inching closer towards my home and my family. An hour flight from Jeddah to Port Sudan is now a 10 hour ferry ride. It's stressful, but there's solace in moving closer. People are escaping, but it's better we go back to our families. Our family is in the capital. They never left. Fate is in the hands of God. Death is everywhere. If you're going to die, you'll die. There's no signal and eagerness gives way to anxiety. I try calling my parents from the satellite phone, but the lines are down. All I can do is wait, impatient and powerless. We finally see land. It feels surreal. We might have an idea of home in our heads, but the reality is now very different. We've taken every mode of transport to get here, be it ship, plane, car, and it's taken 10 times longer than it would have during peacetime. But we made it, and I'm very grateful. We're finally in Port Sudan, but the relief of arriving is quickly overwhelmed by the shock of seeing so many people scramble to leave, who found a home in Sudan from all over the world, now desperate to be anywhere but here. even if it means going back to war zones they fled in Syria and Yemen. What was it like in Khartoum? In Khartoum, it's very bad. Like, I cannot even express that hard and harsh life to live. And that sound, and that, um, what I can explain, it's a war. You know all about that. You are, you're Sudanese, your husband's from Yemen. Where are you going to go? Actually, I'm going to, uh, for Yemen. You're going to go to Yemen? Yeah. You prefer Yemen to Sudan right now? Yeah, yeah. Why? You see, now there is no safety in Khartoum. No safety. The state of those who've escaped is a sign of the horrors they left behind. Intense exhaustion and emotion. No matter what age. Okay. Sometimes I just feel like when I'm leaving, I feel like a traitor to my country. I'm leaving them in all this pain while I'm going to go and have joy. I feel like sometimes you feel like a traitor for doing that. I don't know why. The UK and US took around two weeks to start evacuating their citizens. And now a British warship provides cover for an American vessel. As the wait finally ends for some, of course, we were uh, suffering when we were in uh, Khartoum. They had us totally uh, blocked. Um, but the, uh, as soon as I was able to get to my kids, you know, I felt better. Um, but we're relieved now, you know, so we don't have any issues now. I'm just worried about my mom. She can hear me, you know what I mean? I'll come back for her. So. Do you feel relieved? Yeah, a lot. I'm sorry for what you've been through. Thank you. I'm sorry. Appreciate it. I hope it's a smooth journey with your kids. The choice to leave is necessary but difficult. There are always people left behind. I know the anguish well. It's okay, Mama. But the agonizing wait is about to end. We've managed to get my parents out. After living under constant shelling and airstrikes, they can finally breathe, and so can I. 
سلام ماما They've left our home and the life they've built behind, but they're here alive and I am grateful. A weight has been lifted and I can finally focus on reporting. We take a military flight to where my parents have just escaped and millions are still trapped. The capital, where I was born and half raised. A place of family and familiarity. Now an actual war zone. The city's completely militarized. We can't move an inch without an armed escort. And everywhere we go is marked by battles between the army and the genocidal militia they created. Now the former partners are fighting for power in the heart of our city and country. And just across the Nile, the home my parents fled is in the middle of it all. Bellows of smoke over Khartoum from where there is still active fighting. There have been reports of them looting chasing people out of their homes, and now the fight has gone from the barracks into the town. We're in a very small pocket of safety in northern Omdurman, the old city of the capital. Much of my family is still trapped in southern Omdurman, just beyond the army's reach. Even this early on, urban warfare is making the city uninhabitable. Most of these neighborhoods don't have water. We go collect water from the Nile and take it to our homes. Supplies and shops are running out, factories are closed, the situation is dire. We're praying that the war ends and things go back to the way they were. The army tell us that this will only last a few more days. But little did we all know, a humanitarian crisis of massive proportions was just starting to unfold. We go from the edges of Khartoum to the edges of Darfur, where the wounded are streaming into eastern Chad one after the other. Shot in the hip, shot in the back. It feels endless. We head to the border with the Chadian military. This is where eastern Chad ends and Sudan begins, the sprawling western region of Darfur. There's a dark sense of deja vu here. Images I remember seeing from the Darfur genocide in the early 2000s, unfolding again. And the silence is worse than the yells of shock we expect. There's an eerie sense of familiarity. The Arab tribal militia that terrorized them 20 years ago has rebranded as the Rapid Support Forces, or RSF, and is now powerful enough to war with civilians and the state that first armed them. This valley is officially Darfur, and just across the way you can hear gunfire still ringing out of the villages where fighting continues. And all of these people here have come across to look for safety from what they see is a continued targeted assault. Mm. It looks so young. These casualties are pouring in from Masterai, the village that we saw burning, and all of them seem to be hit by gunshot. <laughs> For children, this is new and intolerable. Bilal is only three years old. 
and even he wasn't spared. <laughs> This is her sister, her younger brother who's three, and her sister have both been hit by bullets. Okay, she's been hit in her thigh. Into Ummam? Ummam when? This is their aunt. Their aunt has brought them here. Their mom is still trapped in the village as it's still being attacked. She says they haven't had a chance to leave. It's just a tragedy. In the three days we're in this field hospital, we see the wards flood with wounded from different towns across the border. More people died than we can count. They ambushed us. They shot us with rifles. They had a lot of arms and came in at four in the morning. They came in cars, on horseback, on camels, and on foot. When I ask who the attackers are, everyone says the same thing. The Arabs. Some don't make it here alive. The blood being cleaned from the floor belongs to a woman called Fatma, shot and killed by militiamen as she tried to escape with her children. And a trip to the morgue reveals more horrifying details. He said that she was seven months pregnant based on the ultrasound, but she's got more of her children outside. Her five and seven year old witnessed her killing and we're told her young son was holding her body when the cart arrived to their village here in Chad. The silent tears of her sister, the calmness of the elders trimming fabric for her shroud. This grief is old and deep. There's no shock in this tragedy, only recurring despair. In the early weeks of the war, 20-year-old camps in Chad were expanded in expectation of a new influx of refugees from Darfur. When we came back months later, even they were full. Makeshift camps cropped up all along the border, and families were being moved around between them. There is no comfort or permanence. But anything is better than the horror back home. Still haunting the people who've made it out. I came because I didn't have anyone to provide for me. I didn't have a meal to eat. My husband and I were at home. Then the Arabs came in and killed him. This is now the largest displacement crisis in the world with violence, disease and hunger reaching catastrophic levels across the country. It's the largest humanitarian crisis too. Yeah, this is tragic. What's happening in Sudan today is absolutely tragic. I look around all of the se sectors, be it food, health, education, are on their knees. 19 million children don't have schools to go to because all of the schools are closed. You know, this is not going to have an impact on Sudan today, it's going to impact the future of Sudan, which is why it's essential that there is an end to the fighting, that humanitarian access is scaled, and that ultimately we have a political solution so that the Sudanese people who did not cause this crisis are able to go home and rebuild their lives. It's been nearly a year of fighting and we're back on the Red Sea coast of Port Sudan. It's now the wartime capital, run by the military, and people here are cramped in tents too. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? 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 How are
Families of these women don't know they're living like this, so we've kept their faces covered. We found the RSF in our home and immediately decided to flee in the same car that brought us. They told us to leave and don't come back until we clean this country and one side is victorious. The militia man closest to me turned and said, our limit is the Red Sea. As the day ends, she leaves to join this training. In the face of guns, sexual violence and abduction. This is a new necessity for Sunni's women who fled their homes. And the peace that was promised in the first few weeks, replaced by a call to take up arms. Why have you come to this training? We came to protect ourselves, our children and our honor from all we've seen. We've seen a lot. It's an insane tragedy. My nephew was killed by the RSF and my niece was taken by them and never returned. I went to different camps across the country and saw young girls who'd been raped. I imagined my daughter in that position and so I came here to defend myself, my country, my honor and my possessions. Young men are joining the military in droves, but it's a brutal war that can kill even the most trained soldier and do far worse to a young man with no option but to fight. He's 18 and he signed up, he says, because living conditions are so tough that he needs the pay. And now he's paralyzed, potentially for life. A bullet hit his spine through his shoulder and damaged his nervous system. There are no specialists in the country to perform the surgery he needs to have any chance of recovery. What did your family say when you said you were conscripting? They didn't refuse, but my mother let out a yell. And then eventually, she let me go. Did you regret joining the military? I'm fighting infidels. How can I regret it? Fighting those who rape and kill civilians. His carer is another new recruit, a 20-year-old friend he made on the battlefield, a university student whose life has been reduced to this, the hospital or the front line. We would be studying right now. We never had anything to do with the military. It wasn't even on our mind. But the RSF have treated us in the most inhumane way, like we are dogs. He was shot walking home from this battleground in Omdurman's central market, a route he's probably taken hundreds of times, but not as a soldier in the view of snipers. It's relentless urban warfare. We're the first civilians to be allowed here, other than volunteers brought in to clear bodies after the battle ended. The army's pleased with their victory despite the horror of this destruction and the continued fighting on its edges. Every corner of this place holds a hidden shock. We enter a random room and find a sniper's nest. The bullet casings on the floor give us a sense of the endless rounds fired. All of this is sacrilege to the people who once lived, worked and visited Sudan's famous Umdurman market. This place is full of memories, not just for me, but for everyone I know. It is the most iconic marketplace in the capital, if not the country. And it used to just be bustling, full of life. You could get anything that you wanted here. You could get, get antiques, 
you could get silver you could get leather and now this is what it is it's just barren and the shops were clearly looted long before this became a battleground and now the destruction is complete When the war in the news is the war at home, every event feels personal. An intimate reminder for millions of people that the home of our memories, of our loved ones, of our friends, is slowly ceasing to exist. <laughs>